Hello, and welcome to the Being Human podcast, where we explore what it means to truly be human, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We upload an episode of this podcast every single week. So what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. You do not want to miss any of these episodes. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Mr. Dan Bassett. Dan is the founder of Grappler Soap. Grappler Soap have the best soap for grapplers on the market. I've tried it myself. I'm very happy to endorse it. If you are a grappler, you want to keep skin infections at bay, or if you're someone with particularly sensitive skin or looking for a soap that's more natural, less irritating than the standard ones on the market, I would highly recommend checking out Grappler's Soap. I'll put the link for where you can go to acquire some Grappler's Soap in the show notes below. So check them out. Great brand built by Dan himself from the ground up. He's only a couple of years into this and the business is already thriving. We talked about that. That's where the conversation started, why Dan started the brand, how he started the brand, but we quickly branched off from there and this ended up being a being human full shebang. We talked about so many different aspects of society and the impact it's having on humanity, on human health, physically, mentally and spiritually. We discussed sensitive topics such as Israel-Palestine, the Ukrainian war. Should we be keeping up to date with the news as much as society pressurizes us to? Is there actually a need and a benefit in doing so? And uh, the issues with doing so. We talked about topics such as transsexuality, the education and promotion of transsexuality and the use of pronouns in schools. Dan gave his opinions on this. I, in turn, gave my opinions as well. We talked about figures such as Andrew Tate and the issue of freedom of speech. And we talked a great deal about human health as well. I asked Dan what he does for his own physical and mental health. We went into things such as cold exposure, sauna exposure, obviously training jiu-jitsu and other types of training, running ultra marathons. Like I said, a being human full shebang. Really interesting conversation. Lots of opinions given in this episode. You might agree with some, you might disagree with others. Drop a comment below and let us know your thoughts on some of the topics we talked about. Also as well, if you find value and enjoy the conversation, make sure to hit that thumbs up, share it around on social media and hit that juicy subscribe button as well or that follow button, that five stars if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Help support the channel, help the community grow. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening and thank you for supporting Being Human. When did you uh, found Grappler's Soap and what were your, your motivations for founding the brand and what were your visions initially and have those visions changed? Yeah, massively. So I was talking about this earlier because um, uh, it all came about with two of my training partners after training and Danny Cornwall, Jiu-Jitsu has got a lot bigger, same as it has everywhere. But I know like where you are, you know, you've got Jimmy, da- Jimmy and Dan and then you've got, you know, places in Nottingham and stuff. And it's, it's a pretty good area for, um, for training. Whereas in Cornwall, like when I started, um, was it now like 15 years ago or whatever? I only started jiu-jitsu because it was a necessary evil for MMA and I was a young bloke wanting to fight in a cage, as um a lot of blokes are. So I was like, oh, I suppose it's better to do some of this grappling stuff. Seems a bit ungentlemanly to me, like, you know, what's the point in this? And then um through the course of training on and off, you know, fell in love with it eventually and uh just full bore. So we're training in the garage, um, and the boys like I do two weeks of the month away um, doing security, which I still do. Um, and the guy's like, oh, what are you doing then when you're home this time? And now, uh, you know, we just beat the beat the piss out of each other, mainly me, uh, get a piss beaten into me. And um, I said, oh, um, I'm going to make some soap. And they thought I was joking. And uh, I was like, no, no, I'm going to make some soap. And they were laughing their heads off. I said, not only am I going to make soap, but um, I said, I reckon I can make it better than defence soap. And so they were like, there's much laughter. Anyway, um, I'd, I'd spent about three months before that thinking about it and trying not to go on a new, like, a new sort of foray into making soap. I was like, I don't want you to be making soap. And I just couldn't find any that I thought was any, any like, good to what I was expecting it to be. Boris, dog on a beanbag. Um, so, uh, I, like I said, resisted the urge for about three months, but I was just researching it sort of when I had spare five minutes. And, um, so after like three months, I said to the guys I was going to make it, I had the idea about how to do it. And then uh, about three months later, after a bit of um, trial and error and sort of messing around with the recipe and tweaking here and there, um, I came up with something really good. It was, it was better than the, the soap brand I mentioned already. 
that everybody knows about, thanks to the Joe Rogan podcast, which is, I'm thankful to them as well, because where I heard about it, and then when I started doing a lot, a lot of jujitsu, I was like, oh, Jake, I've got very sensitive skin. I was like, I can't use um, normal soap, it just ruins my skin. And uh, so I, I made the, I made grappling soap with um, sensitive skin in mind for, for me to keep me free of staff and ringworm and that sort of stuff on the mats. And um, because I have got such a, a fairy sort of sensitive skin, um, it had to be really good for that. And um, the, the expectations of it was to just make 12 bars, which would be a bar a month for me. Um, the boys laughed their heads off about it and I kind of like a challenge or I don't like a challenge. But when I'm challenged, I, I'm stubborn, so I'm in, you know, um, stupid stuff that I've got no rights doing, like I did an ultramarathon because a friend of mine said I couldn't do one and all this sort of stuff. You know, I've got no talent for running at all, did it at like 95 kilos and was the last up one pe people to finish the whole day. And I was gutted when uh, this bird finished after me. I was like, you cheeky bastard, because I wanted to be the, the toughest, shittest runner of the whole event, um, but she was. So, um, yeah, there we are. So, um, yeah, so... I gave them a bar each and then they were like, wow, it smells really good. And then a few people heard about it. I started giving it out. And then I had a spare Instagram account because um, I only had Instagram for, I did a bit of painting, a bit of art. I started had Instagram for that. And um, and then I had another one for like BJJ techniques and stuff. Because you know what Instagram's like for BJJ and it like little 30 second videos of stuff that either does work or doesn't work or looks really good on Instagram's a bit of both. Um, so I was like, well, I'll convert that. I'll call it Grappler's Soap. And I'll stick a cool logo on it because everyone, everyone sort of tongue in cheek loves a shaka, don't they? So, do you know what I mean? And I grew up um, down in Cornwall, it's a big surf culture, sort of bodyboarding mainly, but a bit of surfing. And so there were like some brands like Mrs. Palmer's and Mr. Zog's that were very sort of 90s brands. And so I wanted to go with something that would, I always think, um, and I don't know if I've, if I've made this up or if I've got it off someone on a podcast, but if you, no matter what you're doing, if you want something to catch on, a product to catch on, the logo should be good enough that people would see it on a T-shirt and think it's a cool logo. Even if it's like, you know, funeral services and something that you're not ever going to wear on a T-shirt. If it would look nicely composed on a T-shirt, the door, um, then you're halfway there. So that's why I went with the Shaka and um, just started it off. And my expectations for it were to do nothing, um, get laughed at a little bit and maybe sell a couple of bars and, you know, I thought that'd be brilliant. And then, so I think the first month was like, I sold like 10 bars or something. I was like, man, I sold some 70 quid worth of soap. It was amazing. And then the next month was like 120. I was like, wow, if, you know, if I keep this up, maybe it'll pay for like the finance on my car or like half the mortgage or something like that. And um, where it went to in the first year and then um, the year after that, we, and we've 12, no, I think it's two years this week that we started. Um, you know, like that I made the, the grappler soap Instagram and started selling it on on eBay. So um yeah, where it's come in two years, I expected it to do not a lot. Um and then within the first three months, I was like, maybe it'll pay for, you know, a car or something like that. Or and I said to the boys, I was like, maybe if it pays for us to go to like a seminar or something or go out for lunch or something after training one day, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Like, you know, free lunch once a month after training. And uh then where it's gone to now is within two years I'm looking at it is essentially my um, retirement and and legacy for my kids because it's, it's going really well and um, basically uh, grappler soap is going to be financial freedom for me and my family um, so it kind of seems weird to sort of um, put that into words and sort of hear it come out because there's part of me that goes what um, because you know for, for me like I'm a 40, what, nearly 43 year old guy who's in personal security. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've got another good 10 years in me and then probably another 10 years after that. And there's not much call for 60, 65 year old bodyguards. So uh, I didn't really have an exit plan as such and thought, well, I better, better square my, square my shit away at some point and, uh, you know, hoping for my XRP to come good. <laughs> But uh, I think that might be 60, 65 as well by the time it does. And, you know, but it'll probably go to a billion dollars then and uh, I'll have too much money and drop, just drop dead of a heart attack. So, yes, yeah, so it started out as nothing other than making sex for myself because of my sensitive skin. Um, and then, it, you know, because of, I think, the cool branding, because um, when we first started, it was hard because, you know, you got 
a bar of soap, which, yeah, cool. Like a bar of soap, there's only so many photos of bars of soap that you can put on Instagram every day without people going, oh, fucking, there's another bar of soap. Um, so we started putting up training photos of just us. You know, it's like you're a sweaty mess after, you know, 10 rounds or whatever, getting filled in, you know, pressure marks all over your face and just just being like, oh, oh fuck, I'll just post a, a training photo. And then I think that it worked really well for us that um, – a uh, small small business. I was a one man band at the time. Now I'm like a 2.5 man band, and my wife's pretty much gone full time for us now. Um, she does all the admin and shipping that side of it. Um, mainly about me, mainly to me telling me off for doing stuff. Um, and then I've got uh, another guy and another mate who just come on board now, helping me out with the the production side of it. So I'm trying to um, take myself out of the business that stages where I'm not absolutely essential, still involved, still overseeing, still making sure everything's as it should be, um, if not better than when I do it. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy for me to, like I said, to, to be looking at, A, being able to, you know, knock working away on the head when I want to, not that it's, that it's something I want to do right now, but to be able to look at doing that and to sort of have a have an exit plan and a nice, nice lifestyle and not have to watch my pennies, because where we live in Cornwall is beautiful, um, you know, everybody wants to come down here. Everyone wants to, to come down here and live. The the housing down here is like the it's like the pinnacle of um of the the affordability crisis, with the exception of maybe central London. Um, it's so expensive, and and the the wages down here are seasonal to say the best. You know, it's it's crap for money. So I've, I've, I thought I'd always be working away, and it's always kind of what I have done. So it's really nice for me to to put some energy and some focus into something to to add the authenticity and the passion for jujitsu and skincare um come across and uh, and just be it's really nice when you, you you know yourself when you do something from a place of authenticity without sounding like too much of a hippie and it's well received it's a lovely feeling in it you know um when you try and when you try and do something for for whatever reasons and people throw it back in your face it's it makes you angry and frustrated and all that sort of stuff. So the complete opposite of that is, uh, is really nice to experience. And then to be making a few quid off it as well. And, you know, be looking to sort of have a, have a nice life and be able to focus my energies on something I'm really passionate about, you know, at a fairly young age. I'm, I'm happy with that. It's like, I, I kind of wish I found it, um, wish I found it, uh, years ago, you know, this, the sort of, um, the, the, uh, entrepreneurial sort of side of my life but um you these things come to you when you're ready for it eh? yeah absolutely and i can definitely attest to that as you said i've found out that i have a complete inability almost to put effort into anything that i'm not authentically passion passionately invested in um so the fulfillment that you get when you know because we do these things like you said you started off you just made the soap for yourself and a couple of mates for you that would have been enough just to you know have a good bar of soap to use for it then to transform into you know a whole business and you're at the point now where it's hopefully going to be your ticket to financial freedom and setting up your family that must be an amazing feeling um i was going to ask you 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 touched on the brand name there mr bassett's yeah. Mr. Bassett is a, a fantastic name for a brand, and I have to ask you: Is that your real name, or did you change it by yeah, default? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's my name. Yeah, Dan Dan Bassett or Daniel Bassett when I'm in trouble. Um, yeah, that's that's my name. It's a it's a it's a strong Cornish name. There's not too many of us, but um, we're there. Yeah. And you just started making this soap. Uh, did you have any experience? I say in soap making, you you know, in kind of like you you mentioned you painted and uh, yeah. you draw, so I suppose you've always had that kind of artistic side to you. But did you have any experience like when you first started out? Did you know how to make soap, how to make products like that, or did you really just learn it on the fly? And how did you do that? No, um, I well, I basically looking looking at what I what I've anything I've done, um, I've kind of either been sort of goaded into something that I don't really want to do and done it anyway, like joining the Navy. My dad said, join the Navy. And I was like, I don't know, join the Navy. He goes, well, what are you going to do? I was like, well, I don't know, not join the Navy. He goes, why do you go and talk to them? I said, ah, well, someone heard I was going and talking to the Navy careers. No, and you won't do that. You couldn't do it. You're too gobby. And I was like, I fucking could. So off I went and joined the Navy and 
I was like, I was like, right, I'm going to leave. As soon as I can leave, I'll leave. And then I got like three months in. I was like, well, I may as well stay for a year. And then five years later, I was like, why am I still here? Um, same with the ultra. Um, and then the, the other stuff, when I've, when I've kind of put my, note, put my head to something, put my mind to something and decided to do it, it's because I've reverse engineered the process. And I think it's a really easy way to, to achieve any goal. And I, I, I like, um, I like some of the woo stuff, but not the woo stuff that's, that's bullshit. The woo stuff that's true. Like, um, you know, if anything's possible, then it's achievable. You've just got to figure out how to do it and and try enough times, fail enough times, and keep trying and keep failing, and you know, and then you will get there. It's um, the only thing that's that will stop you there is time. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that one. What's the question? <laughs> Just about whether you learnt it on the fly. I think the answer oh, yeah, sorry. is yes. Sorry. Yeah, went off on the right tangent. Um, yeah, no, so basically I reverse engineered it. I was like, well, what's the, what would I put in a soap that would be better than the soaps I tried? Because I tried Defence Soap and I tried a few other brands. I tried a few independent brands that I found on Etsy and eBay and stuff. And I wasn't impressed by any of them. I looked at the ones that were better than the others, what I would use. And then I, like I said, at this point, I'm like three months into researching soap. And I was like, well, I think what would work for me is like, uh, like a real natural um, oil, like something that's like a humectant and soothing and nourishing, like argan oil, uh, vitamin E, um, and then combined with like a tea tree that, that cleans your skin really well, peppermint uh, and eucalyptus. So I was like, well, I'll try those. Um, I can't remember which combination I tried first, but that's what I settled with. Um, and then I just, I tried a few times with that and then I was like, it's missing something. And then I had some good feedback, good in in terms of, um, you know, constructive. Um, so I like it, it smells nice, but it doesn't lather up too well. So I was like, right, okay, a bit more research. Um, and that's generally just Googling something and going through a hundred different answers and looking like, what keeps popping up or what pops up from credible sources. And um, it's generally like postmenopausal women making soap. So I must have watched like, I don't know, a hundred hours of these old ladies making soap and uh, set up with, uh, put some honey in so, some So you're now not only, you're, you're now not only an expert on making soap, you're an expert on menopausal women as well. I've, I've always had a, I've always had an interest. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and that, so that I was like, well, that's what I put in it. So if, I, if that's what I want to put it in, how do I how do I do it? So just sort of experimented and then um, experimented with the ratios of the honey and the oats, and it, and it came out, you know, nearly perfect after about another sort of month or two or whatever. So yeah, and, and that's when um, I put it on I put it on uh, on sale. Got it all certified by um, dermatologists and all that sort of stuff. And believe it or not, in the UK, there's a lot more red tape than there is in the USA um with skincare products in, in the usa you can just say oh this is soap and it's like right cool in the uk you have to register on the government portal have all your ingredients on there in case someone phones up and said i've i've used x x soap from another brand obviously not mine um i've got this terrible reaction they can go i'll oh, do this do that um so there's a lot of red tape um yeah did all that and then didn't expect a lot from it like i said i was hoping that you know best case might might be a few quid towards a mortgage or whatever and and here we are yeah You mentioned defense soap, um, which, you know, I imagine looking forward into the future will be like a, a main competitor of yours or already is, I suppose. But then another one as well that's uh, been an emergent brand in the past few years is Dr. Squatch. You've put out quite a few memes about Dr. Squatch. Tell us about the difference between Graffler's soap and Dr. Squatch and why people should buy Graffler's soap instead of Dr. Squatch. Because I've, I've used both and I, and I like both. Obviously, I'm going to say Mr. Bassett's is the best, uh, and I do generally mean that. Um, I do yeah. really like soap. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I like Doctor Squatch as well. So, what's the difference, and w why should people opt for for yours over theirs? So, I'll I'll tell you the difference, and then I'll tell you why what the uh, what the like you know fake beef is with Doctor Squatch. So, the difference is that um, difference. With both soaps is that ours just feels so much better and I've got such sensitive skin that when I used defense soap thinking it was going to be this brilliant thing that was going to be exactly what I needed because it, oh, it's triple milled and all this sort of stuff and blah blah oh this is going to be amazing and and I've just found it 
not not great for us. It's not bad. I'm not saying anything bad about defence saving. I'm like truly grateful for them because um, without Joe Rogan going on about defence soap all the time, um, I would never have sort of made the little cognitive switch that I actually, why don't I make some soap? So I'm really grateful for them. And, and you know, everybody in jiu-jitsu knows about defence soap and knows about ring room and staff. So they've really opened up a market out of nothing. So fair play to them. And, you know, whoever they are, like, you know, if I had a, a fedora, I'd tip it to them. Um so yeah, I've got I got nothing nothing but um, you know good good things about them apart from the state is isn't as good as ours and that's it is what it is and they're selling a hell of a lot of money so I'm sure they don't mind me saying that uh, Dr Scotch same thing there I think you know I'm not going to say anything bad about them they've got really good really good adverts you know they've got this you know fake Sasquatch that supposedly makes a soap which I don't think Sasquatch makes a soap so um, you know I wouldn't trust them at all I don't think he's a doctor either um and the soap's not that good um in my opinion of oh, this they're going to sue me at some point I'm just getting chewed up and spat hopefully they'll try and buy us and not and not sue me um yeah it's, it, look it's nice smelling soap but if you have got um if you have got problematic skin if you do get eczema psoriasis um you know, folliculitis, all that sort of stuff. Um, then, no, me knowing myself and my own skin, I can't use that soap. It doesn't work for me. Um, so, I, and I wasn't trying to be like, oh, we're better than these guys. When I first started, a few people, quite a few people, like a handful at least, said to me, "Make sure you price it a pound cheaper than defence soap." And I was like, "No." And they're like, "What? What do you mean, no? Like, you've got to price it cheaper than defence soap? They're the market leader. You know, everyone knows about them." I said, well, I, my soap's better than defence soap. Um, I'm not making it for lower margins anyway. I can't be bothered. I'll just keep it for myself. But, you know, I don't care if less people buy it. I'm going to make the best soap I can. I'm going to price it what I think it's worth. And by weight, it's more expensive than, than defence soap. I think it's more expensive per bar as well. Um, but it's better. Um, and so I've got no problems with that. The Dr. Squatch thing came about because there was an article in like an online magazine, Jiu-Jitsu magazine. And it was about um, training gear, and there was a sub chapter in it about um, protective soaps, and they had like defence soap, Doctor Scotch, whatever. And I just put a thing up saying, I I'd driven home from work. I'd done like a twelve hour night shift up in London. I'd driven home, and I was I was just in the bath chilling, and I, I got this notification. So oh yeah, mate, you go still have a look at this. Of course, I put like um oh hi, you know I understand most of you guys are in the USA. There's some really good soap brands out there. You know, try a few, find the one that works for you. Best of luck to you. If you're, if anybody's in the UK and uh, wants to try my soap, this is where we're at. Um, you know, happy rolling or something. It was a nice comment. I was sleep deprived anyway, uh, but I made sure it was nice. And then I got this like snarky reply back from whoever the duty, the duty num that I in charge of um, Sasquatch is. Uh, that's what I call them, Sasquatch is rather than saying the brand name. Sasquatch's um, socials that day say it was something really snarky like um, blah 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 and I just being like sleep deprived I just bit on it uh, but how about um, how about we have a death match how about we have a, a fight I'll take you to death you fucking Sasquatch or something like this and then I didn't think anything of it and then it blew up and um I kind of forgot about it. I went, went I got out of the bath, had a little nap, and I woke up, and everyone's like, the phone's going, and I'm like, oh no, what have I done? I'm gonna get absolutely destroyed here. I've only just started, and um, it went really well. And then the uh, the page you, you you know the online magazine were like, oh, can we do a, an interview of you and find out what you're about? I was like, yeah, cool. Um, and then so that kind of started this fake online beef with Doctor Squatch, and. Um, it's like, it, I was saying to a mate about it today, I said, it's a bit scary for me because um, everybody tags me in the Dr. Scotch's adverts and says, oh, you should try this stuff instead. Like, and I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to get, like, I don't know, sued or, like, assassinated or something. But, you know, I don't know. It's, it's all good fun. Like, I'm not going to say anything bad about them. I, again, like, they're, they're making the space bigger awareness of soap bigger and people are like oh that smells nice and I'm like, okay cool if you want to use that use that or you could try my soap and uh, you know personally I think it's better as I'm sure they do so 
Well, look, if uh, Sasquatch does try and sue you, I'll dust off my Lord Grey and defend you. I'll probably end up hurting your case more than helping you. <laughs> 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 we'll give it a go. And, 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 if, and if we don't win the case, then we can always challenge them to uh, you know, a death match and settle it how it should be settled with jujitsu, which is how Heel all hook. problems should be solved. Heel hooks and oil checks to the death. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I agree with that. Like I said, I've used Dr. Squatch and I, I like them, but they're a very different soap to yours in the sense that theirs is very coarse, which is fine for somebody that's looking for that kind of thing. But for people who don't want that and have particularly sensitive skin, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't tried any soap that I think is better than yours in that regard. There isn't any. No, no, <laughs> I, I'll say that confidently. <laughs> um, and, you, and you talked there about uh, the benefit of defense soap um, being promoted by Joe Rogan, defense soap becoming the the market leader and the big brand that it is, and then Doctor Squatch doing the same as well. And that relates to something that you said to me over message last week, which was the rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah, uh, you, you kind of that. already explained that, but talk to me yeah. more about that because I re- I really like that saying. So um, it, it's one I really like, and um, it's it's kind of like like that. You know, everybody goes into sort of scarcity mindset now and everybody dips into it now and then because it's just a survival. It's it's a survival thing we've got inbuilt, isn't it? You know, if there's if there's one chicken left, you know, you've got to fight over the chicken, you know, so it's like that. But everybody, not everybody, a lot of people are always in their fight or flight and always in scarcity mindset. And, you know, when you when you try and foster an abundance mindset, and I know it sounds very weary for people that aren't into that, like, you know, fuck them, get on board or fucking don't listen you know, um, when you when you try and have an abundance mindset, you're trying to be like, you know, growth mindset, what's possible, don't think about what could go wrong, have a go at it. Um, good, good, great things happen. And when great things are happening for you and you've got a bit of momentum, um, if if you can help someone else on the way, like a um, uh, guy with a coffee brand um, message today to say thanks for all your help because I like, tried to help him out, and I did help him out apparently. Um, and then, like, I remember when I first started and um, I sent some soap up to uh, Jimmy and Danny, uh, Jimmy and Dan um, at the gym, just like, oh, you know, I've been following you guys for ages, you know, here's some soap, just started a business. Bro. Um, and then they, they went straight on Instagram, put it on their stories of them eating the soap and like, oh, this stuff smells mega. Like, that's that, that really cool for me, really just starting with, like, maybe, I don't know, 100 or 1,000 followers or whatever it was at the time. It's not much more now. Um, but it was really cool for me. And then, you know, and then when Jimmy went back to fighting, I was like, oh, you know, can I be one of your sponsors? And it was nice then to sponsor him. Not not that that's the rising tide lifting all boats, because, you know, he is fighting. Um, but it's just cool. And, you know, if someone's doing well and they can help you out, well, you know, it, it's cool. And it, I, I just think... If you've got if you've got people around you that are positive and, and uplifting and trying to be positive and uplifting, if you can like take a little bit of that on board as well, it's it's so good because it compounds and and the same is true as well with with negativity. You know, if you've got one negative person in the room, they're just a vortex for the for the positivity. And so I try not to be I try not to be like I do on call firefighting and um I was saying to one of the youngsters, like when you come in, even if it's at like 4 a.m. you just got out of bed when your pager goes off um you grab your clothes or grab your pager grab your phone go downstairs get your car key get your house key lock your front door get in the car now you're in the car you've got from the car journey to the fire station to be miserable then when you get out the door at the fire station you've got from your car to the fire station to to be a positive effective individual and then be a positive individual in that team um and uh, you know we don't always get it right, and I don't always get it right. Otherwise, that's how you've got to be when you come in. Because if you come in and go walk in the door and go, ah, what's this now? It's infectious. Whereas if you come in and go, right, well, what are we doing? Where are we going? You know, it's infectious as well. So it's, it works in all different ways and shapes. And, you know, if you're talking about, you know, business or sport or, you know, even at home, you know, like if you, I'm probably guilty of this, focus on myself a lot, and then my wife does everything for the kids and you know, do you know what I mean and you can you need to chip in with everything and it, it just makes everything better doesn't it and you know if I'm doing if I'm doing okay as a soap brand and then someone's got a whatever brand in jiu-jitsu and I can give that a share because I agree with their their values and 
you know, and their brand resonates with me or I like them or all three really, um, then I'll share that. And it's, it doesn't cost anything to do. And for some people, it's like they're giving away a little chunk of their, of, um, of their power or something. It seems like that's, that's how they feel about it. Whereas for me, I think if you can help someone out, help them out and it doesn't take anything away from you. And even if you feel like it does, it doesn't because it comes back anyway. So, you know, again, wooey karma, you know, like you can believe in karma as like this, you know, life force, or you can believe it as like, you know, if I go around shitting on people, someone's going to shit back on me when they get the chance, aren't they? You know? So, um, and even if no one knows you're shitting on them, I think, you know, deep down and then you expect someone to shit on you and it happens. So yeah, it's, um, I just, just try, try and be a good bloke, try and be, uh, a little bit of a force for good um where you can and then it's also sort of like karmic margin in it you can you can be an asshole then but you know once or twice a year and you'll probably get away with it on balance yeah no i definitely agree i mean i'm a i'm a wooey man but uh, even if you're not it's just the way the world works if you yeah. go around being an asshole to everyone then maybe not everyone's going to be an asshole back but a good a uh, good proportion of people are going to be an asshole back you know energy is contagious like you said I was listening yeah, to a, a podcast with Tim Kennedy on yesterday, and he said it's, it's exactly the same principle. He said people talk about how fear is contagious. Courage is just as contagious. If yeah. one person stands up, everyone stands up. So it always works both ways. Yeah. You can be a, a force for negativity or a force for positivity. We're, and we're, Sorry, mate, go on. Was, I was just going to say, and if, if you view you know life as a competition all the time, which is easy to do when you know we compete in jiu-jitsu or we compete in mma it's very easy to then take that mindset and apply it to everyday life when in fact oh, everyday man. life today is, is is not competitive in the same way that it once was so so like with, with regards to like the competition like the mindset i get it um i'm not really wired like that um and like an, another sort of saying that always sticks with me is you go faster alone but you go further together and it's like do you know, do you know what I mean? it's really good isn't it because you know, I could I could do really well if I started whatever brand and I'm just like, oh, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you to everybody. But at some point I'm going to plateau and then it's, you know, another one like your net worth is your net worth is your net worth. It's, you know what I mean? If you're constantly building your net worth, even if you're not building it for um, self-serving reasons, at some point that's going to it's going to benefit you. So, um, yeah. And then like with regards to like, like the courage being contagious thing, you know, um, Tim Kennedy, who I, I love, I think he's awesome. Um, courage is contagious and when you like when you said it like a couple of things popped to mind Tim Kennedy was talking about recently and got a little bit of goosebumps in my arm because I was thinking about this this sort of these two stories and that like it's courage is contagious it's inspiring like we're hardwired to pick up um, negativity because of that it's that survival mindset again because we're hardwired for risk and danger because that could be the the apex predator that that sees us we haven't quite seen we're being a bit lax we're you know we're stepped out of the cave that we shouldn't have and bang we're wiped out you know and that's us out so that's that's why um negativity affects us so badly and some people are just so so honed in on what could go wrong you know and all the negativity in the world there's tons and i don't know if it's the fact that media is now everywhere whereas it used to be you know on the news you know three times a day and the radio or whatever um, but you know, after the last sort of three years with the obviously mega deadly pandemic that we we all should have died from, um, especially those of us not vaccinated, um, that the world seems like a really bad place. Um, it's not a bad place; it's a really good place. But we just see all the shit that we absolutely love and absolutely hate, and the two polar opposites are just sent to us all day so we can engage with it and. Um, you know the the powers that be that I won't name to make a lot of money off their uh, off their platforms will profit from. Um, it's you know it's not good, but you can't like I said you can't be can't be just focused with the the negative all the time. So I try not to try not to get down. I did go through a period of trying to watch the news and just be like, not my circus, not my monkeys. Let's have a look at what they're saying, and then I can dissect it. And I was like, fuck this, you know. So I just don't bother. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a hot take. It's a controversial opinion, I've realised, to say, I don't watch the news, I'm not bothered by the news, because people just think you're 
being ig- ignorant, which I suppose you are, and that somehow makes you arrogant and uncompassionate to the horrible things that are going on in the world. But what right. I always say, the, the, the truth is, um, try keeping up to date with everything that's going on in the world. Like, you, you, you can't. And it, it might come across as, you know, you lacking compassion if you're not keeping up to date on, you know, awesome. Israel, Palestine, if you're not keeping up to date on Ukraine. But at the end of the day, yeah, I, I suppose, you know, I can donate, but I already, I already you know, donate to lots of charities. There, there is always something you can do, but at the same time, what can I do? You know, what, why should we keep up to date with all this negativity in the world when, you know, we've got our own lives to focus on? You know, you've got a family to focus on. Right. You know, I've got a family to focus on. We, we, you know, we've got to go to work every day and, and focus on that. There's things that we need to do in life. So not to say that we shouldn't keep up to date with things that are going on in going on in the world but i think if people don't want to watch the news because they don't feel it adds any value to their lives then more power to them Uh, it's it's a very unnatural phenomenon to know everything that's going on in the world again talking about how we're hardwired we're not we're yeah. hardwired to focus on a small number of individuals dunbar's number dunbar's number yeah 100 percent. yeah we're um we're meant to be in a tribe of you know 100 150 whatever that number was it was it's created 150 i don't think it was exactly that um yeah, and, and then everybody in the tribe, this is the other thing as well, that this is the reason why I don't watch the news, is because it's so one-sided and it is just a controlled narrative. Um, and that, that was, you know, debatable, probably still is to a lot of people. It was debatable, you know, three years ago, four years ago. And then we've seen how things are. And then, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, two, two wars or conflict areas um, that are very controversial. Um, and for good reason, very sensitive. Um, but you know, you're only getting one side of the story, and and it's a bit, you know, I don't I don't want to sit sit there watching the news constantly going, well, where's where's the other side of this? Um, you know, what about this? What about that? We're only getting one side of it, and we're getting fed what um, the people that own the news channels want to hear, or the people in control of the BBC. And we saw how you know biased they were with you know Brexit with. Um, the Chinese flu, which I'll call it because people don't like it, but you don't get don't get flagged for that one um, on Instagram as far as I'm aware. Um, and so, you know, if it's not balanced, then then why would I watch it? Because I'm going to hear it anyway, because everybody just regurgitates it anyway. So I would I would rather listen to a podcast with two people from opposing sides who are very intelligent and articulate. And it's not necessarily who wins the who wins the argument if they're having a debate because that could be the guy that's the, the you know the best conversationist or has the the better skills at arguing. You'll know this from from you know from law. You know I'm sure the the best the best lawyer in the world isn't necessarily the one who does the best in the class. You know it'd be the one who's the best in the in the in the courtroom. So um, yeah, I would rather I'd rather listen to long form debate with um, two people who are informed um you know or more and you know and I really get the full picture and then see what I think is the 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 truth of it or or the truest part of it and try and form an opinion on that and you just don't get that on the news um and it doesn't matter what news channel you're looking at you know um you just don't get it so and and that's why the 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 media you know the established media um is a is a dying thing you know um and you see it with um russell brand that you know he got so big and all of a sudden he's he's cancelled for for sexual assaults um you know he gets his um his monetization taken off on youtube there were no four there, there were no charges made against him so he wasn't he wasn't even charged he wasn't even um you know i don't think he interviewed by police definitely wasn't charged and yet he had his um, all his YouTube, uh, YouTube earnings taken off him, and they tried to deplatform him. And it's like, oh, and that's not an orchestrated attack. And you know, Andrew Tate, who, you know, Marmite, um, I quite like a lot. Of, well, I really like a lot of what he says, or I really like some of what he says. I like a lot of what he says, and some of it I don't agree with. But that that doesn't mean I don't like the guy. Um, but what I didn't like about him was when he was saying he manipulated uh, girls into uh, doing webcam stuff, which he did say. I don't agree with that. I've got, I've got two little girls and that's not something I think people should be doing to, to um, young women or, or young, young men or, you know, anything. I just don't think that's how you should conduct yourself. Um, maybe he's learned from that. Maybe he knows that was wrong. He's now discovered Islam. So who knows? Um, yeah, like I just think and, and you can see when when they decided to take him down, you know, there was like 25 
um, media pieces in on him overnight, and they just came for him. And it was like, and, and the shoddy is the charges that, you know, he got away with at the end. But it just goes to show that, you know, even if he was a really bad person that done really bad things, you'd think that there would be some charges that would stick. And, and even if it was and he was guilty, it was still an orchestrated attack. And that that's kind of like what I don't like about the whole thing, because because they could go, well, oh, you know, ah, oh, we got him, we took him down. It's like, oh, so you are working together then. You know, whereas they they all sort of um, plead that they're, they're independent journalists and stuff and all working independently. And then, like, you know, there's all that thing happens overnight. And you see it with anybody that, you know, Tucker Carlson, they were talking about not letting him back into the USA because um, of treason. And he was like, I'm a journalist and I'm speaking to people. He, he's literally trying to, whether you agree with him or not, he's literally trying to mediate between the enemy of, you know, the the opposition in a proxy war, you know, and his own country. Um, but, you know, he, he's sort of treasonous, dangerous individual. It's like, and then journalists are saying, this isn't journalism. It's like, it's literally journalism. Like, you know, that is journalism. Uh, it's, it's just strange, right? I can't, I can't get my head around it. I, I can't see it for anything other than, a, like I said, people are hardwired to respond to negative stuff, and then you get the happy little segment at the end of the news, like, oh, and in, in, in other news, you know, this four-year old did, did a sponsor's walk and raised two thousand pounds. Oh, amazing! I can feel good now. Um, so yeah, we're all hardwired to that. So everybody wants to see the the bloodiest, horrible shit on the news that's shocking, um, and then you've got people that are making money off the back of that, like the newspapers and stuff. Which, good job, they're a dying breed. Um, yeah, I just I just don't want to do that in my life. Yeah, you uh, you touched into uh, touched on and went into a few points there that I very much agree with. First, being cancel culture, I think there's a big problem with that at the moment. It's almost like there's a a war on free speech. Not to sound dramatic about it or use the term war lightly, but you see these orchestr orchestrated attacks, as you said, and. To uh, reiterate your point, OK, maybe some of these people are guilty. Maybe it'll come out that Andrew Tate's guilty of what they're trying to charge him with, even though, you know, I, I think they actually arrested him again the start of this week. And oh, uh, did they? To, yeah, to, to try and extradite him to the UK uh, so we can. Be... Right. But it does mean it's hard to get because I only read because I don't read any news. I just I hear snippets from other people and I see what comes across my, my laptop at work. I, I think it's they're trying to extradite them to the UK. But even in the UK, the criminal case has been thwarted. And it's um, some people that have, uh, are trying to they've crowdfunded to try and build a civil case against him. So, so again, maybe he is guilty of what people are trying to charge him with. But the, the way that like they're, they're trying to they're having to claw to try and get, you know, people like Andrew Tate, Russell Brand and you know, the motivations for trying to get them at the end of the day aren't because of what they're trying to get them for. It's because they don't like what they're saying. And it comes to the point where you have to say, do the means justify the ends? Do you? And for some people, the answer might be yes. Like, do you think it's all right to, um, you know, be deceptive and orchestrate an attack with um, ulterior motives and ulterior intentions um, for the sake of getting someone for something else do you, do you think it's all right to lie and be deceptive in that manner some people um, might say yes but I, but I think that just if, if you don't have the integrity of the judicial system not to get too legal but if you don't have uh you know integrity built into society built into government then society and government just falls down and I think that's what we're seeing in this day and age people don't trust the government anymore yeah. people don't trust um, yeah. industrial powers and, and big conglomerates and rightly so because people have been lied to multiple times over and over yeah. and a lot of people have got to the point now where they wouldn't, you know, the, the amount of times the government has lied to us, particularly, as you said, with the Chinese flu, if your best friend lied to you that much, there's no way you would trust a word that came out of their mouth. But because it's the government, people do, people still do, which is miraculous right. to me. If, if you, if you, uh, you could ask my wife, my best friend lies to me all the time and say, just come out for one. And I go, OK, mate. And then, you know, 10, 10 hours later, I roll in. And it's never my fault. So, um, yeah, no, it's, um, I don't know. I don't know if this is a uh, Carl Jung quote. I'm going to butcher it anyway. But it's like when you when you stare into the monster, make sure the monster doesn't stare back into you, or you know, something like don't don't become the monster that you you're hunting or something. Well, when you look into the uh, when you look into the abyss, the abyss when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Yeah, and it and it sort of um, 
I always find it interesting because I've got a lot of friends who are um, uh, in the forces and uh, Fury and Special Forces and that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's a bit like even if you're watching podcasts and when you, you, it's the amazing thing about uh, the content we have access to nowadays is you can, you can be a fly on the wall in a conversation between two really intelligent guys and one is, you know, tier one SF who's, who's had this amazing innings has all this wisdom to share about you know about his life and, and his experience and he's like you know a proper subject matter expert um and you can you can just get this knowledge now whereas years ago you, you'd never have had that so i find it really interesting and that's where i think where did the means justify the end it's like um that's like the the question you know with like uh obama and the drone strike thing was a massive one obama obama um realized that they had an 80 percent kill rate of um civilians on drone strikes and he was like we need to change this so so they i'm not laughing because it's funny i'm just laughing because it's just so nicky it's uh, unbelievable it's true um so what they did was they reclassified any fighting age male over the age of 15 as a combatant in a drone strike so if they would target someone at a wedding um and they killed you know 50 people um and then 40 of them because it's a you know a wedding in afghan or wherever 40 of them are, are males over the age of 15 then their you know their kill rate is massive massively reduced with com- uh, non-combatants so yeah that's that's what he did he just changed the figures and everyone's like oh i'm armor, brilliant um that yeah, is, that's the most political thing oh we have an 80 percent kill rate of civilians and a politician any normal person would think let's stop killing civilians a politician thinks yeah he'd make a good lawyer i don't know if obama did have a uh, a starting career in law, but that's exactly a lawyer's mindset as well. Yeah. Rather than actually killing less civilians, we'll change the definition of civilians. Well, t- t- Tony Blair's another one, isn't he? You know, good, good, good lawyer. So, um, yeah, there's there's definitely a recurring theme there. So, yeah, did the means justify the ends? I don't know. And it's like um, it's like the modern day sort of um, f- philosophical point to argue is is like, you know, as we see like you know the falls of empires, you see like the the debasement of the currency, the abandonment of gods, the obsession with sexuality and um, sex. And we're, we're seeing all these things, the rise of the individual, the obsession with individual, the individuality. We're seeing all these things now in the West. And it's like, and then you've got the rise of the BRICS nations, the abandonment of the petrodollar. And it's like, Christ, are we are we seeing the downfall of an empire, you know, uh, and everybody thinks these things happen overnight. Like people say Rome wasn't built in a day, but it, it didn't fall in a day either. You know, these things happen over two, three hundred years. So, you know, maybe maybe we live out the rest of our lives as um, as old men. And, and you know, this is just the same as, you know, the, the Cold War crisis in the 90s. And, you know, everything that's happened every year is like, oh, it's going to be the end of the world. Um, or maybe we're in for, have you, you read The Fourth Turn? Have you heard of that? Good, good book. It's really good. And it's a really good book. Uh, I listen to it on Audible because things go in my tiny little brain better on Audible than, than it does when I have to read the, the words and actually work out what the little squiggles are making into my eyes. But um, there's a really good uh, podcast with Tony Robbins and the, it was written by two guys. I, I forget the guy's name now, the one surviving author. And it's a really good back and forth about the book and he explains it all. And I always thought it was a very negative thing, the fourth turning. Uh, basically goes on to say that yeah it could be really negative like you know if, if we're in the fourth turning and a turning is generally 20 to 30 years i think which is roughly generational um to to humans um and so you you know like good times make hard, good times make uh weak men weak men make hard times hard times make good men and it goes on so they, they're saying that we're in the fourth turning now which is the winter of our society uh, sorry the autumn of our society and then we hit the winter which could be like you know world war three and we have this tough time that maybe it's like 1940s um europe and then we get through that time and then we're back into the spring and the summer and the autumn and you know for, for guys i'm a little bit older than you but guys like you and me we see you know the the winter the spring and the summer and you know maybe we're 70 80 year old guys talking about jujitsu in 40 years time and, and world war three and that we that we may may or may not be conscripted due to our age. So um, yeah, I don't know. Do the means justify the ends? It's, it's like, well, what's what are we doing in you know in the Middle East or in Ukraine or whatever? Because you get one side of the Ukraine story, you don't get the other, and it's like, is, is this is this all so that we don't lose our 
our, our position in the hierarchy in, in you know globally um and then like we get sort of knocked off by china you know and, and those guys who definitely wouldn't be good guys to be under so do the means justify the end as well I, d- I don't know because there's a lot there's a lot of shady shit that goes on it talks about tony blair you know like the the sex up dossier and you know dr david kelly's apparent suicide and that sort of stuff and Maybe the means justify the ends. I don't think they do, but who knows? And I definitely don't want to be a don't want to be a slave to you know Chinese corporations, and I don't want my kids to be either. So uh, fuck knows, mate. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting what you said about the fourth turn in this being the autumn and uh, you know a potential winter coming next. I'm in general a very positive and optimistic person, but I've got to say it kind of feels like that. <laughs> um, you, you look at the world and there's so many issues, you know, the, the wars that are going on, the political tensions. Um, but more importantly, the, you know, the, the war on free speech, to use that term again, um, the way people are being censored, the way, you know, governments, you know, you can't trust the government anymore. And then you throw in issues such as the environment and climate change and stuff. And it's like, is the world even going to be here in the same way as we know it in 100 years time? Who, who knows at this point? There's so many potential threats and we've made it this far. So you know our great great grandchildren might look back on this time as like oh what did they have to worry about this was you know the the best time in human history and it's only gotten better i I hope that's the case but uh, i I don't know and then they look at they go online and find like the the old internet you know podcasts of us talking about this and they're like what the fuck are they on about idiots it was all fine it's just like again like it was like the cold war and nothing happened you know i don't know how close we came to total annihilation during that but um Maybe that's where it is. But like when, when you talk about like the free speech and cancellation, that sort of stuff, and, you know, and uh, the importance of, you know, being authentic and stuff. And, you know, we talked about that just just after or just before, you know, you, you sort of mentioned Andrew Tate. Uh, it's one that I kind of struggle with a little bit as well, because like I said, a lot like a lot of what Tate says, some of it, I, some of it I don't agree with. Um, I don't think he's a bad person. I think he's done some things that I wouldn't think are very, uh, very good things to do. They wouldn't align with his religion. They wouldn't align with, you know, Christianity or, you know, sort of great moral ethics, so, you know, and, you know, I, I kind of, it's almost a bit weird for me to sort of uh, speak about that on a podcast because he's got such influence and such following that, uh, and I know people that are, that are close to him and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And so I don't want to say something about Andrew Tate on Instagram and get annihilated by him. But also, I don't think, I don't think he would do that anyway. And and but the the main factor in you know in me saying something that I don't agree with about someone very powerful with influence is that the whole the whole thing you know that I talk about all the time on every podcast is the one thing that's really worked for us is authenticity, you know, and honesty where I can be honest. And so if I've got an opinion on someone and I'm asked about it, I'm going to give my honest opinion on it. And you know, and as and like I said, as someone with a couple of little girls that have grown up, you know, like, you know, both, both not teenagers yet, you know, in five, 10 years, you know, they're, they're going to be teenage girls um, and there'll be young men around them. And if I've, if I've then been sort of wishy-washy about how I think people should um, talk to them or treat them in certain aspects, then that's on me. So I think, I think if you have got an opinion and you can be honest, you should be honest. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, uh, one of the most basic rights we should have is to be able to speak the words that we want to out of our mouth. That's literally what it comes down to at the end of the day. A restriction on free speech is essentially, you know, it's a figurative restriction that it's like when they used to cut your tongue out in middle age times. It's it's the more humane version of that. Um, And I think the issue as well today is because there's so much news and it's not objective anymore. Everything's got its agenda. People yeah. like Andrew Tate or Russell Brand, all the people on you know the other side of the fence, people on the left, the the woke people. I bet a lot of these um, woke figures aren't as woke as they make out, but they've got to appear to be that woke because otherwise they won't get the views. You've got you've got to there's there's no you know there's so much less coverage for the rational person that says things you know balance in a balanced way is an extreme about it, says it you know, with rationality and reasonability. Those people don't get anywhere near as many views as, you know, Andrew Tate or big woke figures. 
so it's I, I think they've been forced into it by it's, yeah the, the the tyranny of the minority um i heard it referred to as recently and it's like you know when you go if you go to a restaurant or you go to the supermarket and stuff you see like vegan stuff everywhere it's like vegans are like i don't know three percent or one percent of of society and so because they're so loud about it and and i completely get why they're loud about it because they believe that they're doing the right thing for the right reasons and you know you can only applaud someone that you know if they think they're doing the right thing for the right reasons wanting to tell people about it and wanting to be able to to be able to do that you know i I disagree with you know why they're doing it i did look into it myself and then i realized that it doesn't matter what you eat you've displaced something from its home or you've killed something in the harvesting and so you know um it, it just happens and animals get killed in in wildlife anyway you know it's just how it goes so um we're, we're animals and we, i think we need to be be kind animals wherever we can be but you know we are just animals so yeah it's, it's we, i went into um to primary school this afternoon um trying to graduate uh no for a parent teacher for my um for my eldest and uh awesome, awesome teacher i'm a chat with her and i've I spoke to her a few times before um and I might not have voiced my opinion if I hadn't spoken to her before and she didn't know that I'm not a complete arsehole that I've seen. Um, and we had an email from from the school recently and it was about like an inclusivity day. And it was like, oh, we're, we're working with um, Cornwall Pride, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. Um, it's a primary school um, and we're selected, part, it's part of the national curriculum. Um, and we're encouraging ch- the children to think about pronouns and select the pronouns if they would like them so i was like i got i got the email and i was like for fuck's sake and i didn't say anything to anyone and then i had like two, two or three whatsapp straight away going Have you seen this? and i was like yeah yeah brilliant it, like this is exactly what we need not the fact that, that, that there was no consistency of education for two years or you know whatever else is going on we need um we need kids to be, uh, you know, encouraged to, to select pronouns, you know, like, oh, I, it's like, oh, yeah, do you know what? I'd never thought about it. Actually, I do feel a lot like a cat. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm a cat, so I'm going to be a furry now. Like, and I, and I said to him, I was like, look, I, the reason, the reason why I'm telling you now uh, as a teacher is because I didn't want to respond in an email because I considered the amount of time it would take for me to try and articulate my point effectively without coming across as a bigot. Or, or too soft the other way, so not to get my point across. I didn't want to get in a back and forth. Um, we're probably going to have opposing views about it. I said, but I don't think we need to be encouraging primary schools to think about and then select pronouns. I think if they feel like, you know, whatever it is they feel like, then they should be told, you know, if you, if you feel like this, then, then that's cool and, you know, you're welcome to be yourself. Um, to a point, you know, not a furry, as, as a few kids down here who think they're furries now in school. Which is crazy. Um, so, but I said, as as someone that's you know a potential employer of of um, this generation of children, and my generation is the employers, and the generation above us, which are even less tolerant of the bullshit that's being encouraged. I was like, if someone sent a CV to me and they were like, oh, I'm this, this, and this, I'm really hardworking, I'm down to earth, blah, 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 blah. Um, these are my pronouns. Like, I'd be like, fuck off, mate. You like, I don't like. These are your pronouns. Like, Jesus Christ, like what on earth like i just we i think maybe i've got a maybe i've got a poor understanding of this because i've not been through you know through that experience but the way the way i am is like you know if you're gay cool you know that's no problem if you feel like a woman cool no problem as long as you're not competing against women in mma or jiu-jitsu or something i've not got an issue with it you know be who you want to be as long as you're not hurting anybody else but to encourage um to encourage really small kids in their formative years and they're called formative years because that's when they form their personality um to to sort of think about that sort of stuff you know it's just crazy yeah i mean uh it's such a nuanced topic isn't it and such a sensitive topic um but but, but i agree i i think it, the tyranny of the of the minority is the correct term i believe for it because there's no question that there is a subset of people out there, a subset of people in society that are confused about their gender. And I, I until very recently, had a, quite a, a hard line on this. I, I was 
you know, in the camp of there are only two genders. Well, for sure, there's only two sexes. There's a difference between sex and gender, right? Sex being the actual biological um, hand you're dealt and gender being the expression of that sex, so to speak. So it's a bit more social than it is uh, biological. Uh, but I was in the camp of there's only two genders. This is ridiculous. Um, and then I listened to quite a few podcasts of uh, various people, one of them being Eric Weinstein. Uh, and he, he said, look, there, he, in his opinion, there is more than two genders. He said he, he doesn't know what they are, but he said there's enough people in the world that say they're confused about their gender and that they don't necessarily feel like a man, don't necessarily feel like a woman, that it seems reasonable to say there is more than two genders. And I did think about that and I thought, you know what? There could be actually be some truth in that. And that's it. I mean, I'm no expert on this, so I, I can't really say one way or another yes, that there are two genders or there aren't. But, but what is certain, in my opinion, regardless of that, is that despite there being a minority of people that clearly you know, do need support and are you know, confused about their gender, the majority of people are not. Yes, they're, they're like, there's a healthy uh, play with gender when children are young. You know, boys will like dress up in a dress, you know, in their sister's dress. That doesn't mean they think they're a woman, like they just or think they're a girl. It's just natural play. And I, I think we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're trying yeah. to cater to a minority of people so much that what we're doing is, OK, great. We're, yeah, we are catering to that minority. We've also confused the fuck out of the majority now right. and, and caused so much damage because of it. So, yeah, we should absolutely be accepting and help minorities. Um and another point you raised as well is like gay and transgender. They've all been grouped into one LGBTQ plus oh, group. I, I, I don't know if if um, like the homosexual community is happy with that, because to me, they seem to be two very different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, um, so, yeah, that, that's what I'll say on that. I, I, I think we've caused so much confusion for so many people. And, and in this um movement of trying to help people that do generally need our help we've also actually hurt a lot of people that you know a lot of kids that were completely fine when it came to understanding their gender or, or experimenting with their gender growing up and we, we've done a lot of harm in, Mate, well, in trying to do good yeah well what, you know you, you said like throwing the baby out of the bathwater it's like yeah okay there's there's um there's some people that um like people say the suicide rate with trans people is really high um, I don't. I don't know why that is. Um, couple of couple of theories, but I. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Um, researched reasons why to to be able to sort of really have a strong theory of that. You know, not that I would ever have one. Um, but we talk about like suicide and mental health and stuff. It's like the the people that are killing themselves are young men. Do you know what I mean? It's it's the biggest killer of of uh, men under the age of forty. Um, blokes topping themselves left, right, and center, and you know, COVID saw that spike massively. I said the word then, so sorry about that. You can believe that. Um, and um, and yet, people were still talking about this um, supposed pandemic that you know had invisible symptoms that you know you couldn't see. And what you had to do was stay at home, you know, eat junk food, drink the discount beer from from uh, Tesco's, um, and don't see any of your friends for you know for a year or whatever it was. And, you know, there were people snitching on each other for being outside over their hour of exercise. Like, like we're in a health pandemic and they're shutting gyms and they're telling people to don't be outside for more than an hour. Stay on your own. Right. And it's like the, the biggest relating factor to um, to um, early mortality, apart from the, obviously the Chinese flu, um, is uh, isolation. And what did we do in this health pandemic? We told people to stay at home on their own, you know, and you know we, we saw what happened after that we're now seeing the the subsequent knock-on effects of um deaths with missed cancer appointments all this sort of stuff and then you know whatever else is going on that's causing all these people to drop dead that that the media just can't put their finger on you know experts are baffled to the the rising amount of cancer in young people or, or whatever else it is it's like well christ you know i'm obviously not a doctor so i couldn't possibly hazard a guess of what that is but there's something going on um it it just baffles me that you know it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? You know, like it's almost like it's like the homelessness thing, isn't it? It's like you know you can't you can't cure you can't cure homelessness, but you can cure it when the Olympics is in town and you know or Xi Jinping arrives in LA, you know, and all of a sudden there's no street homeless anymore. And it's like, well, how did you do that? Um, you've got all these all these men killing themselves, and everyone's like, every time it's, it's someone 
you know, close to you. It's like, oh, that's sad. And it and it really is sad. And it's sad for everybody. And it's sad for everybody in that family. And it, it goes up and down the generations um, and all their friendship groups. And yet nothing, nothing gets done about it. And maybe that's because nothing can be done about it. Or maybe it's just because, I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't get it. Um, yeah, it winds me up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the topic of that then, because we have effectively talked about health in one way or another for quite a lot of this discussion. Grappler's Soap is effectively a health brand, right? Yes. Uh, so what are your views? I mean, we've already touched on them really, but just kind of to hear them concretely, what's your constitution when it comes to human health on a physical, mental and spiritual, if you want to call it that, emotional level? My my personal my personal sort of what I do or my, my well yeah yeah what what you do and what you'd prescribe obviously you're not a doctor but you know what no. what are your thoughts what what should people be doing people that want to you know and apply it you know in particular to because obviously a, a big portion of the audience of this podcast is young men apply it to young men specifically if you'd like but yeah what what should people be doing to take care of their physical health take care of their mental health take care of themselves emotionally spiritually however they want to um, you know define that. So, so what um, I only know what works for me and what has worked for me in life, um, what hasn't worked for me. Um, like jujitsu is, you know, you know, it's everybody that does jujitsu just tells everybody to jujitsu for any for any problem. Ah, divorce jujitsu, you know, just giving up rugby jujitsu. Oh, I'm lonely jujitsu. Oh, I don't have any friends jujitsu because um, you're you're exercising without thinking about it. You're like meditation free violence, right? Um, Murder yoga, meditation free violence. Because when you're doing uh, jujitsu, you're completely focused on the present moment when you're when you're rolling. Because you can't think about anything else. Because you've got to be focused on what you're doing, even if that's when you're you know you're doing the you know I can't remember what the um, the the Chinese term for it is, but no mind, you know, like the I don't know, kung fu or wherever it comes from, the the act of no mind where you're you're doing stuff on autopilot you know when you first got taught a i don't know a scissor sweep or whatever um you had to think about what you're doing and then years into rolling you do a sweep on someone it won't be till afterwards or you watch it on video and you're like that's what i was doing um so it becomes so you're focused on the present moment you're getting um you're physically bonding with people you know you're having you're socializing with people um and you've got like a common a common goal and community i think it's that's why like um, CrossFit is so good. It's community, uh, peer group, uh, accountability, you know, and, and growth. And, and that's like the same with like, I don't, I'm not a fan of it. Slimming World, Weight Watchers, all that bullshit where they, calories don't exist and they call something else, like sins or whatever else it is. It's not all bad because there's, there's community and peer group accountability and they, they have a goal and they've got, they've got this thing and they all come together and, so it's not all bad. It's not for me. I think it's a bit of a, I'm going to say it's a bit of a con. There's aspects of it that I think are a bit, bit silly, a bit mysterious. Um, but yeah, so, so for me, um, love jujitsu, A, because I want to be the, the sort of the best I can be if I get into trouble. Um, I said do security for a living. Um, but just walking around, you know, like when you learn how to fight, that's generally when you stop getting into fights in the street, isn't it? As a young bloke, we all like scrapping and, you know, like testosterone's high and you can, you've got an overhand right on you or whatever. And, you know, as young blokes, you're trying to test yourself, get up the hierarchy and you start lifting your weights to get yourself up the hierarchy. And then, you know, maybe, maybe girls start taking notice of you. Maybe they don't. Um, and that's all we're doing is because as young men, we've got no intrinsic value to society. We're expendable. And you see, you see that in every war. And this is why people are killing themselves. Um, this is fucking terrible. So if you if you're doing something where you've got um, you've got a social group, you know, and you put in effort and then you you go up the hierarchy a little bit. So, you know, you know Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, um, you know, like at the very bottom of it is like um, water, food, shelter. And then it's like um, social standing, uh, love, respect. I can't remember what the order of it is or whatever. So the least important, the least important thing is at the top. But if you've got all these things in modern society, you know, you've pretty much always got um, 
water you know you you can always get food you know no one's going to die of starvation in the uk even if they're in our bins i'm not saying that's right or wrong but that's that's food taken care of but then if you're eating out of bins you know your social standing your self-respect is going to be like dangerously low you know if you if you've got all these things and you know you, you yourself i know like you said like you know you ditched um you know doing law in london because you didn't want to be there and you probably you know maybe I'm, I'm putting words into your mouth here but you probably looked at yourself at the age of 60 having had a career in the city and thought fucking hell what you know what will I what, what will I be where will I be what will I have to show for it and do I want that and maybe you have a, a brilliant career in the city and you get to the age of 60 and the only thing you've really got is a love for fucking drinking in port after 10 a.m every day and you don't have any any love in your life or whatever and so you're like right fuck this so you know, it's it's still a fail. You know, it's um. So yeah, so so jujitsu I love, right? I love lifting because I was a really small, really skinny kid, and I hated being a really small, skinny kid. Um, my dad was a bit of a machine back in the day, and like all people could see was my dad was a machine. I was this tiny little kid, so it's fucking annoying. Um, and I was always saying I'm gonna be fucking massive, <laughs> and everybody always thought it was really funny. And I was a scrappy little scrum half at school, you know. I'd, Hands like frying pans, couldn't catch a ball, but because I was short, I had to play scrum half. Um, always fighting on the rugby pitch and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I just love lifting weights. So I get a nice feeling off lifting weights and get a bit of a sweat on. So for me, like jujitsu, lifting weights, um, cardio, I get from jujitsu, right? I cardio get from get filled in by my mate's brown belt and another mate is mine's a purple belt. So hard rounds of them, that'll do for me. <sighs> I enjoy longer runs, like the ultras. So I got into that. I enjoyed it, but I hate running like shorter distances. You know, I like I like the ultras because you can walk up, up the hills, eat Harry Bows and chocolate, and then run down the hills in the flats. It's perfect. Um, so yeah, so cardio is important. I don't like doing it, but I get from jujitsu, so I backdoored it. Um, for me, hot and cold is really good. You know, um, I got into I thought it was bollocks. So like six years ago. Um, just before I joined the fire service, um, I got pneumonia at work. I got, I think, bacterial pneumonia, I think it was. I felt like I was dying. I like, probably was dying, in fairness. Like, it's just, <laughs> I think it's, a, you know, it's a few people that die of pneumonia. So I felt awful. And I got some antibiotics and um, I felt better again. And I was like, what, what can I do about this? Because I used to get a cold every two or three months and I always had them. Um, and I uh, saw like Wim Hof was sort of being banded around at the time. And I was like, what a lot of shit. Like, you know, this crazy Dutch guy. And I was like, fuck off. Well, I laid a box. I thought, do you know what? I was, I was at work on, on shift on my own on, on a night. And I was like, oh, this like, takes 10 minutes. I was watching a podcast and like, I don't know, Bisping or Joe Rogan or someone was doing it. And I was like, oh, I'll try this. Felt amazing. Felt mega. Um, and I was like, well, Although I think this is a lot of bollocks, it did feel really pleasant. So I was like, right, well, I'll do this. I'll do this every night for a little bit. I'll see if it goes anywhere. And then I started doing the cold showers. And um, I didn't get ill for like, let me guess right, three, three years. I didn't, get, I didn't get a cold or a sniffle or anything for three years. And in six years now, I've had, I've had three colds, including Omicron at the tail end of COVID. Um, and one of those colds I include were doing Marcellatines at training and I had about 20 Marcellatines put on me in an hour and I had a sore throat for like a week. So I'm, I'm counting that one cause I don't want to be dishonest, but, um, but yeah, so I used to get two or three colds, you know, two or three colds at least a year, every two or three months I'd get one generally, um, glands would swell up, be blocked up, all crap. My nose was crap. I couldn't breathe through my nose for years. So you can see like rugby nose. Um, and then fighting as well. So been broken like 10 times. So I just thought that my nose was knackered for life and I had no chance of it. I started doing Wim Hof and then I spoke to another mate of mine, a bit of a hippie as well. And uh, he was like, have you ever noticed you can breathe through your nose after Wim Hof? I was like, do you know what? I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me, but yeah, I had. And he was like, yeah, mine's like that. Then I started um, taping my mouth up for like, I started to, trying to do like a minute or two minutes breathing through my nose. And it was hard work. And then I started listening to a guy called Patrick McKeown. Have you seen him? Irish guy. Oxygen Advantage. Um, awesome. And um, loads of mates of mine were sending me these things about training with nasal breathing. I was like, I can't breathe from my nose at all. I haven't like for, for like eight or nine years. It started to piss me off. 
Patrick McKeon saying he's only referred like seven people out of like, I don't know, 17 years of practice for um, for the uh, deviated septum operation. I was like, wow, that's interesting. So I started doing a minute, two minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. And then I was doing like a whole shift with a mouth tied up type, type of work, you know, and, and then sleeping with it, you know, um, and uh, just change your nasal breathing like that. So that's been massive for me because it, when you breathe through your nose rather than your mouth, it, it massively recruits your parasympathetic nervous system, gets you out of fight or flight. Like I said, so many people are in fight or flight all the time. And we haven't really evolved the 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 software um, from when we were, you know, in the trees coming down onto the plains, you know, and like I said, we see that sort of apex predator that's going to take us away or, you know, if it's a rival of ours that's going to, you know, take our dinner and won't be able to feed our family. So everything every single threat to your um, your existence, you know, if your boss is going to give you a bollocking at work or whatever, we equate it to that, that fight or flight engages and we're like, fuck, I'm going to get sacked here and then I won't be able to feed my family. This is the worst thing. And every, people are in this fight or flight the whole time. So the nasal breathing has been really good for me. Um, I used to do quite a bit of meditation until I got into the breath work. And then I realized that, you know, like there's like an old... Um, uh, old saying with like meditation it's like if you don't have time to meditate for 20 minutes you should meditate for an hour um it, like it's really cool really funny but when you need to meditate is when it takes you the work the the biggest amount of graft to try and get into anywhere into a meditative state because you've got all these things going on where i find with breath work and with some people it's running you know they go running and they just kind of switch off and they concentrate on the running anything where you're with your breath whether that's yoga you know, jiu-jitsu, running, um, you know, Wim Hof or Tumo or whatever the other breathwork um, practices are. Um, it's so good for you and good for your mind, good for your body, because your your body doesn't know what you're doing to it. So when you're doing your breath work, your lungs are working. Your lungs are just working. They don't know you're not going anywhere. When you're getting your heart rate up or getting your heart rate down, your heart doesn't know what your legs are doing. It just knows it's got a demand on it. So, um, yeah, th those have been massive for me. So, yeah, got to hot and cold and breath work um it got into in the first lockdown um i ordered a freezer for my garage and um it was when like everybody was buying tons of frozen meat because every, everybody was panic buying everything so you know, there's like shortage on freezers so i was trying to buy a freezer um to fill with water obviously as an ice bath so i found this one i ordered it online anyway and then i got this phone call back off the lady at the company and i'm sat in the front room with my missus and the kids and uh Hi, Mr. Bassett. It's such and such calling from whatever company. I was like, hi, thinking, oh, I like, I hope she can't hear this. You see, I'm just phoning up to confirm your order of the freezer. I'm like, yep. She's like, um, right, okay, and you meant to order that. I'm like, yep. And she's like, okay, cool. Can we, can we deliver it on? I'm like, yep, I'll be home. So my missus goes, um, have you ordered a freezer? I was like, yeah. She goes, what, what for? I went for the garage. She goes, oh, oh awesome. Because she's on it about having a bigger freezer. <laughs> she goes, I was like, yeah. And she's like, for food? And I was like, no. She goes, can I put food in it? I was like, no, it's going to be full of water. <laughs> she's like, Megan, not impressed with me. So I got into the ice bath then. And uh, then I got an infrared sauna next to it as well. So it's only it's like a tiny little half garage. Um, but I've got like a full spectrum infrared sauna. I mean, ice bath next to it. And like after jujitsu, you do two hours of whatever, open mat weather, and you die in. And you go do 20 minutes hot and then two minutes cold and cycle that. Like I go to bed and sleep like a baby. Um, but like with the, like I said, with the hot and cold, although I recommend it to everyone. And, you know, I've got a cut on my foot because I went in the sea for a dip the other day on Mother's Day. When I went to see my mum, I was like, I was just nipping because she lives by the beach. I was like, quickly quit go and see. Um, I recommend it to anyone. But the thing with the cold is I got so into it that the, I do think it is absolutely awesome for your health and makes you more resilient, more robust, but boosts up your immune system. You know, it gives this massive dopamine hit that's elevated for hours, like 200% um, dopamine hit, which they said elevated for hours. It's absolutely awesome. Get all your norepinephrine and all this sort of stuff. So you feel great. It's like the runner's high. It's a, it's a real chemical reaction. Um, when I break my, when I break my leg three years ago, whatever it was, um, I had like an injury every year and the same month for like three years. My mate broke my leg doing trying to do a bulldog choke on me, sitting back as I like went to shrug him off. He went straight through my leg. So it was bad and it, it like blew out my PCL and it went, it went bang like a gunshot. 
and I and I was like uh, rolling around trying not to like make girly noises for a bit. Popped up and I'm like, no, nah, I'm right. And they were going, no, 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 no. <laughs> My mate Watson, who um, he was watching this, he'd be like, oh no, like he was literally welling up in welling up in tears because he knew he'd break my leg. And uh, and he, was, I got this photo of him. I was like, get my phone out because he was like nearly going to cry. And he said he cried all the way home hysterically because <laughs> he was so upset about it. Mate. But um, my foot, my my uh, leg was knackered. So I come home, my missus made me phone one by one the next day. Eventually went to hospital. They were like, no, you haven't broken it. And next day, like, oh, you've broken that. Um, I went, I just ice bathed the shit out of it for like seven days. I went to the fracture clinic seven days later and I walked in carrying crutches and a knee brace that they'd given me. And the guy was like, like looking, like genuinely like looking at the notes. It was like a comedy sketch. And he was like, Mr. Bassett, I was like, yeah. He's like, you broke your leg seven days ago, ruptured your um, PCL. I was like, yeah. Uh, tore your PCL, whatever it was, grade three tear. Um, I was like, yeah. He's like, how are you walking? I was like, slowly. And he's like, no, no, how are you walking? And I was like, I just, I've got a good tolerance of pain. I don't want to be going around on crutches because it's slow and tiring and gets me all sweaty. Um, and I've been ice bathing for like 20 minutes a day. And he was like, right, well, whatever you're doing is working. And then like three, three weeks later, I was like, oh, I'm good. And um, I went, I'd like, because I was doing, I spoke to a friend of mine who's a physio. I was like, I've got to do something. I'm going to go crazy. And they're like, maybe if you do some steady cycling, um, it'll promote blood flow. There's no impact. That'd probably be quite good for us. I like, oh, okay, cool. So I started doing 30 miles a day on the bike at the station with a broken leg. I, I said, ice bath and the shit out of it. I went back to work and then the um, I didn't have an ice bath and all the inflammation that I'd suppressed for like three weeks just went bang. And I was like, ah, fuck, that hurts. So yeah, so I'm I'm a big, big advocate of um, cold therapy. Doors just opening. Who is this? Oh, it's Vicky. Hi, dear. Um, big advocate of cold water therapy. My wife's just popped in. What are you up to, dear? Going to get a drink? All right. Um, embarrassing her. Uh, yeah, but it's um, it's not like the, the universal panacea. It's, I think it's part of it. So, yeah, the hot, hot and cold's been really good for me. Um, bit of balance as well. Like, I, I don't go 100% with anything, but, um, you know, I'm not 100% with jiu-jitsu, I'm not 100% with, you know, grafting all the time for the same brand, but I think if you can try and get balance in something, um, that's where it is. I try to not eat too much processed food, I try to not eat too much carbs, because it just bloats me out and makes me feel shit, um, but I do love a bit of cake, um, so I'll have a bit of cake. If I was going to only eat one thing, it would be red meat, and I could do it quite easily, um, but, you know, like a bit of a bit of homemade bread or a bit of homemade cake or a pasty or something like gee, like I wouldn't want to not eat a bit of bread ever ever again so yeah that's so for me I think like eating like whole foods where whatever that might be for you and for it for different people it'll be different things like I don't respond well to carbs you know I get all like bloated and feel crap but you know some people do so do what you're gonna do she's back <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of that. The uh, the nasal breathing, I've been big on for a few years now. I read a book by James Nestor called Breathe, Breathe. or Breath. Yeah, so fantastic good. Fantastic book. Yeah, fantastic book. So I tape my mouth at night, try the Wim Hof thing, all, all of that stuff. Um, I think that's really important, especially for the parasymp parasympathetic nervous system, like you said. Mm. Hot and cold, massive fan of that as well. I mean, anyone that follows me on Instagram knows how much of a, a lover of red meat I am. <laughs> I'm very much on the extreme end with that. But, uh, you know, I, I think the number one principle for nutrition, whether you're more plant based or animal based, whatever it is, is eat real food, eat whole foods. That's uh, my stance on that. Yeah, 100 it, percent. It's it's just mad, like how, how squirrely it gets and how like it gets turned into some sort of um, some sort of like magic. And it's like the same as weight loss and and um it, it annoys me like people people say oh it's not calories in it's not it's not calories in, it's not calories out you know it's not absolutely calories in calories out because like you know like sean baker always says you know a thousand calories of, of red meat and a thousand calories of ice buns are going to do different things to your metabolism um you know for you know you eat a thousand calories of cake it's going to affect you completely differently to a thousand calories of steak um so it's not just calories in calories out but 
what what a way to to judge it you know calories in calories out it's so it's so simple and then people go oh it's not that simple it's like no it is that simple it's not that easy and i find it frustrating when people can't people seem to like they just won't acknowledge that you can do something about it by um by by changing your diet or changing what you eat or how you eat it or when you eat it or how much of it you eat um it's not as easy as that but it's as simple as that and it's the same as like with you know if you want to um have wealth in your life you know you need to earn more than you spend okay right and yeah granted if you invest in the right things um then you can do very well um but if you're earning more than you're spending you know you're not going to end up with no money um it, it's just simple and and that's i try and you know talk about like humility and stuff i try and bear that in mind because i i could find it very easy to look down on people that struggle to manipulate their own weight um because i can do it really easily well, i say really easily for me to put weight on was a real struggle it took me like 15 years of weight training to get any muscle at all so it wasn't easy but i was committed because i had the reason to do it but I, I will shit out money like it's going out of fashion, right? Um, if I'm not careful. And so I know I know that if I want to be rich, then I need to be making a lot more money than I'm spending. But I will still spend money like it's going out of fashion. So what I find easy with regards to manipulating my body weight, um, and somebody might be fat as hell, but have loads of money in the bank, they might look at me and go, what, what a dickhead of his money, you know? So that's that's kind of how I try and see it from the other the other side of the fence, you know. Yeah, again, I'm absolutely the same. I've always been so disciplined with training and nutrition, sleep, all of it. Um, I can count on one hand the amount of pennies I've saved in my 25 years of living. <laughs> my 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 phone, you know, I've, I've, I can make money. You know, um, haven't yeah. made any in a while since I left law, but I I can make money. But uh, like trying to budget and spend, it's just uh, I'm going to have to marry someone that's very, uh, you know, thrifty or financially minded or I just need to be monumentally rich, which is hopefully going to be the case anyway. So, it. yeah, but, but, it's yeah, it's, it's, it, again, like you said, simple principles. Uh, it's not always easy to do them, but they are simple at the end of the day. And you just have to bear that in mind. Um, a final question to end on. We've kind of all, you've already talked about it really but to again like kind of put a concrete stamp on it jiu-jitsu um health the grappler soap business all of that what does success ultimately mean ultimately mean to you and do you see it as a meaning to life if that makes sense um i would i would say they could be the same thing but for a lot of people they'll be there'll be different things and I, I you know I feel like a bit of an asshole when I'm trying to sort of provide an answer for question this because I you know I'm trying to square my own shit away um you know I don't have the answers for everybody else so all I know is what I figured out for myself and I won't have figured the whole picture out of myself you know just yet so if I ever do um I think the the meaning the meaning of life or you know however you phrased it I think for a lot of people could just be purpose I think people strive for people strive for happiness when um, you know if you look in um, historically in war zones around the world or in the third world, like suicides are really low um, because people have got a, such a harsh existence that all they're focused on is survival, and so that is their purpose. Um, it can be the same thing because um, success might be um, you know it might be financial success. Um, but then if you like I said, if you don't have that, um, you know, you know, a partner or someone to share your share your time or enjoy your enjoy your money with, then is that really success? So that would be different for different people. For me, I would say no. Um, it might, you know, your purpose and, and your idea of success could be, you know, having a having a loving family that are all doing well, you know, all happy and, you know, healthy. That's that would be success for me. Um, having uh Having kids that are sort of, you know, they're going to go through like the three stages of your, of your how you view parents, and it's like um, idolize, demonize, humanize. So, you know, as you as your kids turn into teenagers, they're going to be like, oh, dad is such a dickhead, 
you know, and then they're going to see you for the the person you are one day, you know, whereas when you, when you're, they're toddlers, they think you're awesome. So, um, yeah, if it, you know, if I'm an old man and, you know, I'm not absolutely broke working for somebody else, um, hating life, going on about conspiracy theories and how the media is, is out to get us and the government are bastards and, you know, and, and my kids are well-balanced individuals, then I'll be happy with that. So that, that would be success for me. But obviously, like I said, you know, that's not me being, oh, that's all I need, you know. I like to have a fucking shiny car, you know, <laughs> motorbikes or, you know, whatever it is. I like that. I like nice things, you know, and I want to have a nice house and live in a nice house. So, you know, I'm not saying I'm not materialistic, but, you know, it's not the important thing. That's like the top of the top of the pyramid, isn't it? It's like, you know, the, the social status or whatever, where you are in the hierarchy of, of males or people or whatever. It's not the important thing that that sort of, what I really like, this is really cool, to give you, to give you a long answer to a short question. There's uh, two studies I find really interesting. One is that, um, the, the study I find really interesting is that um, they studied, I think it was Harvard, did a 70 year study on four generations of men in New York area, all from different um, different uh, demographics and, and sort of, um, ends of ends of life. Um, and there were people that went from no money to loads of money, loads of money to no money, up and down, vice versa. People that went to jail, people that killed people, you know, all this sort of stuff. And they found that the the most important thing for them, what they what they deemed was most important to their happiness was the importance of the relationship close to them. Um, it's really interesting. And I believe this to be true. I always talk about it. I probably need to go and fact check it, but apparently, I don't know where I read it, um, people with Down syndrome are statistically the happiest people on earth because I believe they only generally have like a handful of people in their life, you know, they have uh, relationships with and it's, you know, their, their parents, um, siblings and a carer and, you know, and some close friends. And because those relationships are so good, they're so happy. It, like, it makes perfect sense to me. So, if that's not true, then I apologise, and you know, and if it's true, it makes perfect sense. But I like it anyway, so I'm going to go with it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, and I'm going to quickly go off on a, a tangent now, off of what you've just said. I uh, I wrote an article on my Substack a couple of months ago now, and I called it the crisis of intimacy, and it's basically um, I, I can't take full credit on. Uh, for it obviously I got ideas from from podcasts and books that I've read but I, I definitely saw it myself in the world around me as well and that's this crisis of intimacy which is to go back to Dubar's number or whatever it is we, we, we can only our brains can only process um, you know our souls can only process having relationships with a certain number of humans we can only be concerned with a certain number of humans and because of globalization technology the media we're having to try and relate to billions of people and as a result you know we, we just we just can't do that we're overloaded but then the other side of it is i think because of that because of tech because of globalization we've actually become more distant from the people we're supposed to be close with and it's the we're now in this gray area where we don't actually have any intimacy in our lives because we're more distant than ever from our parents our grandparents our brothers sisters cousins children and then we've got so many shallow, superficial surface relationships of people we don't even know that we've never even met or spoke to that we, you know, not even interact with, see online. We, we have like these relationships with them and we're overloaded with those. So we've got so many shallow relationships and not enough deep ones. And I do, I think it's a, a crisis of intimacy. And it goes yeah. back to what you were saying as well about, you know, health. The social element of it is so important, having people around you, having good relationships with people. That at the end of the day is going to motivate you to be physically healthy, to you know go to jujitsu, whatever yeah, you know, yeah. whatever your jam is, and uh, be mentally healthy as well. Yeah, so mate, I, I, I think I, I think I heard something on a podcast the other day, and I've heard it a few times recently. It was like thirty percent of men um, don't have any sexual relationships, um, and it's like, and they were saying like, apparently the top one percent of men are doing all, like, all the shagging, and everybody else is doing very little. Um, I don't know about that. I could, couldn't comment. I'm married, so I don't do don't do an awful lot of that anymore. Anyway, uh, she she'll kill me when she sees this. Um, yeah, it's, it's 
it's weird, mate. And you know, I was I was lucky. You know, I was a rugby player growing up, and so I had I had a really good sort of um, social group playing rugby. But rugby attack attracts a sort a certain type of person from you know from all sort of works of life. But um, it's a certain type of person that plays rugby. Whereas jujitsu, like conversely, is very strange. And you know, you'll go to jujitsu and you have you know gearheads, you know, that are massive. You'll have, um, you know, guys that used to play rugby. You'll have guys that are in the forces, guys that are ex-forces. You'll have guys that are complete hippies, guys that smoke weed before every session, coppers, villains, drug dealers. Everybody just meets at jiu-jitsu. No one fucking discusses work. No one discusses politics or whatever. And you just roll and everybody gets on. And it's like, it, it's, again, the elephant in the room. And it? it's like, he's a copper. He's a drug dealer. They're rolling. Yeah, cool. Everything's good. No problem. Everybody gets on. Um, yeah, and that's why I think jiu-jitsu is, is so good. And I got about it to everybody. Because you don't, it doesn't matter, like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're massive or if you're tiny or whatever. You can find your game in jiu-jitsu and find what you like. And no one's going to just beat you up because you're a 60 kilo white belt. It's like people are going to be nice to you, you know, and I, I think it's awesome. Yeah, I, I think that's the perfect full circle. Jiu-Jitsu solves all problems. It's this safe yeah. haven from the madness of society that we find ourselves in today. And that's if you want to be staying fresh on the mats and doing as much Jiu-Jitsu as possible over the long term, what do you need to do? You need to some buy grappler soap. You need oh, some of that. Some little body wipes. Oh, yeah, you need some of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dan, thank you uh, for this evening. I think we could sit here and talk all night long um but I'll, I'll let you go now we'll definitely have to do one of these again at some point and hopefully in person at some point as well mate definitely uh, if i if i don't get cancelled off some of my political views then uh, i'll definitely be keen to do another mate thanks very much it's been lovely talking to you mate and uh be good to catch up in person likewise done cheers, cheers bye bye